Hey guys, it's Cece, and today I am here to talk about my very favorite found family stories. So this recommendations theme was chosen for me by my lovely patrons. Every single month over on my Patreon, patrons of a certain level get to vote on a video that I will be doing the following month, and my patrons chose a found family media recommendations as their option for March. You may notice that this uh, video isn't called found family in books, although I will be talking about a lot of books. I am also going to be talking talking about my favorite instances of the found family trope in my favorite TV shows and in some of my favorite movies. So this is an all over recommendations video. So that is what I'm doing here today and we are going to wrap up the intro there because I have so many things to talk about. So to start with I wanted to explain a little bit more what like my version of found family is or what found family means to me in fiction. Some definitions of found family um, include the fact that characters need to not have any kind of blood relationship in order to form a found family. I don't think that's true. That doesn't fit within my definition of found family. What is important to me in a found family story is that it's about a group of friends or a group of people coming together not really knowing each other and they form incredibly close bonds. And some of those characters maybe have family members and some of them probably don't. But what's important is that they create a new family together. This is, I would say, my favorite trope in fiction, probably. That's it's pretty easy to say. I love love stories that have this trope and I think it is really a resonant trope for a lot of people in the LGBTQIA plus community. It's just something that so many people in our community have to deal with. But because you might face a lack of acceptance from a traditional family structure, queer people come together so often in other communities and form incredibly close bonds. So a bunch of the books, at least, that I will be talking about feature a lot of queer people because that is generally a theme. It's true of a couple of the movies and TV shows, but found family gets used a lot more generally in movies and TV and it doesn't usually include queer people because there's still a real reluctance to put LGBT humans uh, front and center in a story in a film or a TV show, at least one with a wide audience. So yeah, more queer stories in the book section than the other two. But before we talk about fiction, I wanted to quickly talk about one non-fiction book. That is Real Queer America LGBT Stories from Red States by Samantha Allen. I just read this book this month in March, and I wanted to talk about and recommend this book because it gave me a lot of passion and love for the queer communities that we create, which is very much what this book is about. It's about queer communities in states that are very conservative coming together and how vibrant and accepting those communities can be. So if you want to have like a lot of power in your own queerness and in the family that you have created for yourself, I highly, highly recommend this book. It is a great, great pick and I could not get through this video without talking about this book because this is like a real life application of found family in action and Samantha actually talks a few times about found family and building those relationships because it's something that she had to do when she came out as trans to her family. She kind of had to build her own queer community. Um, so I just really highly recommend this. But with that out of the way, let's talk about books with found family tropes. Okay, so the first one I feel is a given that I was going to talk about, and that is The Raven Cycle by Maggie Steve Fodder. I feel like it was a given that I was going to talk about the series because it is my second favorite series of all time after Harry Potter, and this book is basically just a friendship to the max series. I would argue that one of the people in this book has a very strong family structure, but even that family structure that Blue, the character I'm talking about, has is built up as its own found family. Like, she comes from a found family and then creates another one. She was raised by her mother and her mother's two friends who just sort of met each other one day and created this loving, wonderful home for psychic women. So I would argue that Blue is part of a family, but she's part of a chosen family that her mother created. But the boys in the series have varying degrees of family relationships that work from just families who were neglectful to families that have died to families that are openly physically abusive. And so I think it's a really powerful, beautiful story, this one, that no 
single character in this series could have done anything that they accomplished without the love and acceptance and passion of their friends that they create in this first book. It's just an essential story for found family, in my opinion. Obviously, Harry Potter is also a culprit for this trope, but like, everybody knows Harry Potter. I'm not gonna recommend it to you. Next up, I wanna talk about Anger is a Gift by Mark Oshiro. I think community is so deeply essential to this story, which is about a main character, Moss, who is dealing with anger, who is dealing with a lot of anxiety over um, when he was younger, his father was killed by the police. So Moss has to deal with a lot of that. And then Moss, along with his friends, they're all dealing with their school increasingly treating them like criminals when they're just trying to get an education. So this book is sort of about an uprising, these teens coming together and organizing a resistance, organizing in order to be treated like human beings. And this group of friends is so incredible and wonderful. They are basically all queer, and that is from like all ends of the spectrum. These kids are lesbians, are bisexual, are trans, are asexual. There is a hijabi character, a disabled character, and almost every single one is a person of color. And this is like an exact blueprint for the kinds of communities that create these found families. Moss has a wonderful mother who he loves very much and is very close with, but what has gotten him through so many different difficult moments in his life is this other found family that he's created with his friends. Next up is one that gets to like the heart of what I love about found family and that is Six of Crows, the duology by Lee Bardugo. And before I like fully figured out that found family was a trope I loved, originally I thought it was just sort of a group of misfits come together have to get something done and reluctantly start to love each other. Which was like my teen way of saying found family, but is exactly this book, which is about six criminal kids pulling off an impossible magical heist. There are so many things I love about this book, about these two books. Um, at the heart of it all is the characters, though, and their relationships with one another. Uh, some of them are romantic, some of them are purely platonic. But ultimately, they're disaster children who reluctantly form a family, and it's my exact vibe to a T. Next up, Nimona by Noelle Stevenson. This is one of two graphic novels I will be talking about. Noelle Stevenson, I would say, writes a lot about found family, and I think that's because Noelle Stevenson writes a lot of queer storylines, so just inherently is about that. Like, I'm not gonna talk about Lumberjanes, but Lumberjanes is a prime example of found family. I would talk about Nimona, because Nimona is about an angry shapeshifter who wants to become an apprentice to Ballister Blackheart, who is a villain, but she doesn't understand why Blackheart's schemes aren't more devious, so she's trying to kind of push him to get more and more devious. I love this because I love angry girls. That is a huge other favorite thing of mine in fiction. I love angry girls, and that is what Nimona is. But also, this is about her and Blackheart kind of getting over mutual trauma and loss in their past. It's about learning to forgive and forget. It's about understanding. Um, and then although Blackheart and Golden Lion, the two dudes on the cover of this book, aren't explicitly in a relationship, Noelle has like since apologized and said that she would have liked to make it more explicit, but but I would argue if you're not straight, and even honestly if you were straight, it's pretty easy to see the implication of a relationship there, a previous relationship. Um, it's just a brilliant book and a perfect example of this trope, as is everything that Noelle writes. I haven't watched She-Ra yet, but I get the feeling in my heart that that is also a found family story. Am I wrong? Next up, the other graphic novel I wanted to talk about, and that is Check Please, Book One, Hockey. Uh, by Ngozi Kazu. This is years one and two of Check Please. I've talked about Check Please a lot. You guys know the deal. Um, but this is about Biddy, who is a charming uh, vlogger, baker, figure skater from the South who goes to college at like an Eastern university, joins the hockey team. I love this story so much because it uh, also like ticks all of my little found family boxes. In that Biddy is sort of odd, by athletic standards. He's a very soft boy. He loves to bake pies. It is essential to him that he be able to bake pies and he's gay. And yet this is a story about a group of foul-mouthed hockey boys absolutely falling in love with Biddy and everything he represents and all of them becoming their own family. Um, Biddy comes from this past where he says that his mom is his best friend and she remains his best friend, but something that 
is not really touched upon in this book, it's more touched upon in the uh, year three and year four that is up online, is that Biddy is very scared to come out to his parents, and so I think the more time he spends with this group of people who love him, the more he learns that acceptance exists, and maybe the more distance grows between him and his parents. You can tell that there's this loving, wonderful support system behind Biddy no matter what happens, and I love it. I love it so much. It's my favorite part about this. Um, so yeah. Check, please. <laughs> and the last book I'm gonna talk about, though certainly not the least important, in fact, like, <laughs> the first one I wrote down, uh, and that is The Color Purple by Alice Walker. I think this is particularly an example of found family I wanted to talk about because one of the aspects of this book that I wrote about in my, like, Women's and Gender Studies English Honors Thesis was the way that this book queers the family dynamic. This is about a character named Celie. She's a black woman living in the South in the early 20th century, and the book spans her entire life, starting from being raised by an abusive father to being married off very young to an abusive husband, to eventually learning to love and accept herself, accept that she loves another woman, and build a more powerful family. Like, this book is emphasized over and over again that nothing about Celie's journey would be possible without the support system of these people who come into her life and give her the power she needs to free herself from a terrible situation. And I love it for that so much. I love it for everything. Like, I still have all my post-it notes in here for my thesis, so it's totally covered in notes. And there are so many things I love about it, but that is one of the central aspects of this book that I love. Okay, now we are going to talk about TV. I have a few different TV shows to talk about. First I will talk about uh, the first TV show where I was like, hey, it's that trope I love. I don't have a word for it yet, but I like it. Uh, and that's Firefly. Like, this is, I would argue, the show I'm talking about that's most comparable to something like Six of Crows in that it is about a group of basically all criminals kind of coming together and then eventually pledging their undying loyalty to one another because they all love each other a whole lot. I absolutely adore this series and the movie for all of the relationships. That is what the series exists for, basically, to me, is all of those complex relationships between all of these different characters. Next I want to talk about a sitcom and that is Brooklyn Nine-Nine. You knew I wouldn't be able to make it through a, a video talking about television without talking about Brooklyn Nine-Nine, right? This is one of those series where we know some characters have family members and they've shown up on the show to varying degrees of like showing acceptance for the central crew but the show does not shy away from the fact that everybody in the precinct becomes a member of that family like captain holt is their dad <laughs> it is said explicitly at multiple times by multiple different characters. When things go wrong in certain people's family lives, then everybody else shows up to support them through that situation. I'm talking about Rosa because because queer and the family. There's just so much about the show that I find so deeply healing and that I have adored so much every time I've watched the show all the way through, which is many, many times. And it is that this is a group of people who love one another unconditionally, who have learned to love each other over multiple seasons, are still willing to call one another out when they're wrong, but just... I just adore each and every one of them for their little relationships that have formed and the little family that they've created. I also wanted to mention Pushing Daisies because it's my favorite show of all time, so of course this is the thing that's involved in the show. Um, so like, the show is about a pie maker who's also a necromancer. His name's Ned, and when he is very young he learns that if he touches something, um, it will come back from the dead, but if he touches that person again, they will die again, but for good this time. This is a very light show. Everything is filmed in very high saturation. It is light and cheery and airy, but it is a story about a necromancer and solving murders and using Ned's ability to wake people up from the dead to get victims to come back to life to tell a detective who killed them. I don't know, it's my favorite show of all time. And while Ned and Chuck are the center of the story, they are the relationship that is building between both seasons. Um, this is also very much something about Emerson and Olive and how Emerson kind of becomes the reluctant uncle about how Chuck and Olive become like 
reluctant sisters. Even though it's a show about necromancy and murder and romance, it's also a show about the family that you build in all of these weird circumstances. So that is why I love it. Last two shows I want to talk about fairly quickly. First of all is Buffy. Um, this is just like standard. This is... Buffy is a show you're going to find on any list of recommending found family stories. Because sometimes those themes are very explicitly stated, I would argue like with Tara later on in certain seasons. Buffy's just very explicit about that theme and they explore a lot with family and with family dynamics. The Scooby Gang is what makes that show that show. It's about three people who become friends and how they eventually get more friends and they all fight evil and they all love each other and they all get really mad at each other and sometimes it's dysfunctional but it's- I love it. I love it. And that moment with Tara that I was mentioning that I'm not like spoiling anything it's just like the moment where they state that is one of my favorite moments of the series because of my love for this trope. And the final show that I'm gonna talk about is Sense8. So um, I, I have to talk about this. This is a weird one because it is about chosen family to an extent, but it is about a chosen family that is forced on a lot of characters very suddenly. Sense8 is a sci-fi show about eight strangers all around the world who suddenly find that they have a psychic connection that links them all together. Let's say the first season is very slow to start as far as the, like, found family kind of aspect of it, although some of those characters in season one, even outside of that psychic link, have to form their chosen families, um, namely the two queer characters. Lido, who is a Mexican gay character who has a boyfriend but has to keep it secret, and um, him and his boyfriend also have a new person that they introduce into their little family, and then Nomi, who is a trans woman and is a lesbian, you know, has been absolutely rejected by her family. So her and her girlfriend very much create a queer community for themselves. But, you know, eventually it is about these eight people and the people in those eight people's lives coming together and creating this weird, wonderful family that spans countries and it's my favorite. I absolutely love it and it's just- I- I love it. And finally, I want to talk about just a few movies. So the first one that I'm going to talk about is, like, quickly, hopefully becoming relevant again. I want to talk about Zombieland. Um, and I want to talk about Zombieland because supposedly the second one is coming out sometime later this year, maybe 2020. I'm going to die. <laughs> so this is a zombie comedy, which is, like, one of my very favorite subgenres of film. I love zombie comedies. There should be more of them. But it's about four people who meet during a zombie apocalypse, and, uh, they try to fuck each other over a few times, but ultimately they're, like, family for life. And, you know, th I know that that's the theme of this video, so it feels repetitive to say that that's what this is about, but I love a good zombie comedy that, at the heart of the story, is about family. <laughs> it's- it's just like my perfect film, but with icing on top. There's also Lord of the Rings, which I know is a book series, I know, but I could never get through the books. Um, I read the first couple, gave up midway through Return of the King, never finished reading them, um, but the movies are near and dear to my heart. That is- that is what those movies are to me. It is about, um, the fellowship and everyone who comes together to form the fellowship becoming family. And like, some of them literally are family. Um, like, Merry and Pippin, I believe, are cousins. But yeah, I love all of these people coming together and going on a quest, and that quest bringing them together as a family. A weird, weird family that I love. It would be absurd if I didn't quickly talk about Lilo and Stitch, because uh, the- the line from Lilo and Stitch is something that people use to describe found family stories all the time. It's that line that Stitch said, like, this is my family, I found it all on my own, it's little and it's broken, but it's good. <laughs> like, that line gets used for everything, found family-wise, and it, I think it's super weird and great that that became a thing in the Lilo and Stitch expanded universe of, like, the show and the other movies, just weirdly bringing aliens into this little sister relationship in Hawaii, just gradually adding aliens onto their family. I don't know, it just feels essential, because Lilo and Stitch is a perfect film to me, um, and it's because of this central line, the central theme. Two more movies I want to talk about. The first 
is Perks of Being a Wallflower. Um, again, I know this is a book. I read the book. I liked the book. I like the movie more. <laughs> and I like its example of found family a little bit more than it is presented in the book. So that's why I'm talking about the movie. This movie makes me cry nonstop and it's because of a lot of the things that Charlie talks about of being a wallflower, of existing on the outside, and of being welcomed into this community who immediately embraces and loves him, I think, more than he's ever been given that sort of good version of love before. Um, and obviously this is also about Sam finding a family because her home life is garbage and it is about Patrick finding a family because his home life and the home life of his boyfriend are absolutely horrible and he is searching for acceptance and love. And I love that this is a story about three people who are desperately seeking love without reservations and love without caveats which is a kind of love that all three of them have been receiving for so many years. That's why it means a lot to me. Um, and there are other members of their little found family group, but to me it will always be Sam, Patrick, and Charlie. And I love them. And finally, the last thing I'm going to talk about, the last movie I want to mention is two movies, and that is the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Um, Misfit Criminals! doing crime, becoming a family. <laughs> there, we brought it into every single part of this video. I love the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. I think that they are phenomenal. I love both. I like the first one like a titch more, but honestly, I love the second one so much because it is about, you've built this found family and it's because none of them have any kind of family to speak of, so they're kind of forced to create a family of their own. And the second one is kind of questioning what happens when one of those people is confronted with, like, a biological member of their family. What happens then? Does it change the found family structure that you've created? And... I think that it draws really fabulous, wonderful conclusions. I absolutely love the Guardians. I love characters as they are continually introduced. I love a lot of the Guardian stuff that was in Infinity War. In fact, I pretty much love every bit of the Guardians in Infinity War. Um, I feel like I'm stating some like unpopular Marvel opinions by being like, I love Guardians too, and I love every bit of the Guardians in Infinity War. But I love the Guardians, and I love the weird, wonderful space criminal family that they've created, and I am worried about them at all times. All right, that is the end of this recommendations video. I hope you enjoyed hearing more of my found family media recommendations. Are there any examples of found family in a book, in a movie, in a TV show that I didn't talk about that you really love? Let me know down in the comments below. Um, I feel like I didn't talk about stuff like podcasts, like Welcome to Night Vale is very found family oriented, or like, anime because Sailor Moon is very much about fan family. Like, there's more that I didn't talk about. So let me know what stuff I didn't talk about down in the comments below. I look forward to reading them. Thank you so much to my patrons for choosing this topic this month. It was a lot of fun to write down all of my favorite things and discuss them. I hope you enjoyed watching, and I will see you in another video very soon. Bye!